Hello and welcome to the three-time award-winning Tough Girl podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you while increasing the amount of female role models in the media. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. The Tough Girl podcast was started on the 4th of August 2015 and this year we'll be celebrating its eighth year anniversary. There are now over 600 episodes for you to listen to in the back catalogue, with new episodes going live every Tuesday at 7am at UK time. If you love adventure, challenge and hearing from women who share their stories and provide top tips and advice to help you take on your own personal challenges, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out. I do also sometimes release bonus episodes on a Thursday. Please do keep listening until the very end as I share more information about what's going on with me with Tough Girl Challenges, give shout outs and recommend other Tough Girl podcast episodes. More information can be found at toughgirlchallenges.com. I'm Zara Rose. I was born and raised in Hastings, which is a little seaside town in the south of England. I went to school here. I later moved into London and lived the whole city life thing. I actually studied fashion design, but I never really went into the field. To be honest with you, I kind of went into like real estate. Through living in the city, I guess, I kind of really began to miss home and the seaside town that I grew up in. But although I didn't really spend a lot of time exploring that, I really, really missed the nature and just being around greenery and the ocean and hearing the sound of the crashing waves. I ended up going and exploring firstly my hometown, I think during lockdown, that was kind of what led into it. And then I ended up exploring a little bit further afield via the Muslim Hikers, which is a group that runs in the UK. What was it like for you growing up there? Did you have any siblings? Were you sporty? Were you outdoorsy? I have two younger sisters. And unfortunately, growing up here, it wasn't incredibly diverse. So there was a real lack of like sense of community and, you know, friendships that were kind of understood. I think as a Muslim, firstly, like the religion also wasn't very understood, like in the area that we grew up in. Um, it was a very, very small, slow, small, slow. <laughs> it was a very, very small knit community. Um, and so there wasn't really that immediate understanding. And there was a lot of explaining as to why we couldn't eat certain foods or why we were fasting, or why we were praying. So it kind of felt like we were a little bit out of place, although it was such a beautiful town, but we had a very, very close knit family and we really enjoyed like exploring as a unit, I guess, on weekends and things like that. So although friendships were kind of limited, I, I would say for my sisters and I, we were very lucky to have each other and also very lucky to have like a really, really big back garden to be very, very close to the seaside. So although we were kind of limited by friendship circles, I guess, or people like us, um, we really had like a vast space of greenery that we were able to really enjoy growing up and have that really imaginative and exciting childhood. Did that change for you when you moved to moved to London or went to university? Yeah, it was really strange. I remember the first time I saw people like me was when we went to like a little outdoor expo. Um, no, sorry, it was an education expo. I went to the outdoor expo this year for the first time, actually. But it was a little like educational expo for like universities, I think. And that was the first time I really saw like other Muslims and like brown people. And I was like, wow, oh my goodness, there's so many people here. And this was in London. And I just, I think that was the first time that I really felt like there were people my age that were like me, which was really strange because it kind of, set the tone that university was going to be really exciting for me. In that sense, like when I moved to London, I knew that there were there was a sense of security that I knew there were going to people be people like me and I wasn't going to have to explain myself constantly. That definitely changed in London and I really, really had the best time in university. But funnily enough, in my university, because I chose a creative subject and it was fashion and there weren't very many people like me on that course either. I think there, were, there was only one other person in a headscarf that was also Muslim in the entire year. I think by then I'd already I already knew what my identity was and who I was as a person. So I felt a lot more confident and I didn't really feel the need to explain myself because everybody else had come from much more diverse areas too and I was kind of accepted as I was so that was a really lovely feeling but I really love London in general just for the diversity that it offers but the diversity in people yes but the diversity in landscape not so much. (laughs) Did you have many sort of sporty outdoorsy role models when you were growing up? Um, probably my father actually. So he was a marathon runner. So, um, growing up, like he was always like in the top 200 runners for like half marathons and marathons that he was running around the areas. Um, Hastings Marathon is very sought after actually. So we're quite lucky that he had that on his doorstep and he really enjoyed running it. So growing up, we saw his medals, his photos. He had loads of newspaper cutouts and things like that. So he was really my inspiration. And although I knew that there weren't many 
like hijabi Muslim runners, I always knew that there were Muslim runners in general, which I think was a really lucky thing to have. So my father always encouraged us to go to like do cross country and to do like gymnastics and all of these extracurricular activities. So we would do like javelin, long jump, like anything that you could have possibly imagined that was like an after school sport. My dad was very encouraging. My mother also was very encouraging in making sure that we attended those and we were able to excel in whichever sport that we chose. So my sisters and I were very active in that respect and we also enjoyed like horse riding badminton played for my county and yeah we really excelled in sports but again there weren't many people like us but I think growing up also I didn't wear the headscarf until I was maybe 14 so up until that age I didn't really experience very much like discrimination in the sporting field but I think once I hit that age it was like oh you can't wear this uniform or even ballet then became a bit of a challenge like leotards and things like that that weren't particularly modest or covering so we did face challenges in terms of like what was expected of us in terms of uniform form but I think all of our coaches in general and all of our teachers were very supportive in that respect I still remember like the first day I turned up to school like in a headscarf and people started laughing like my friends or people that I thought were my friends were literally at the school gates laughing as I walked in and that was extremely difficult and then it was it kind of continued even with the teachers they were like oh we didn't recognize you and kind of made it a big deal when it didn't really need to be because I knew I was still the same person and a part of me I think felt like I had to change my personality entirely because my exterior had kind of changed in that respect but I think I later found my people and people that I felt comfortable being myself with but yeah I didn't really experience very much like discrimination in sport I guess until I was a bit older. When you said sort of change your personality did that make you either want to become sort of like shy away from everybody hide or become sort of louder and more, more confident. What do you mean by that change in personality? I think before I wore the headscarf, I was already really confident and like very self-assured, but I was also very naughty. So I was quite rebellious in school, not like, not to the point of expulsion or anything like that. But um, yeah, I think I kind of shifted in that. Now I don't only represent myself. So although I'm funny, I'm outgoing, I'm very friendly, all of those kind of things that are still very much part of my personality with a touch of like rebellion thrown into the mix. I kind of felt like, okay, not only do I represent myself, my personality, but I also now represent a faith and Although I don't want to say like I am the representative of Islam in this entire area, there wasn't another Muslim in the school that I went to or in the in even in the college that I went to. I did kind of feel a big sense of responsibility that now I can't maybe be this rebellious person in academia, but I could still be rebellious in terms of challenging the expectations of me. But yeah, I felt I felt a huge sense of responsibility I think to carry the religion as well as myself but yeah I think overall it made me a better person because I was a bit more conscious of my actions I think even still it's a big responsibility for a 14 year old but I think had there been a lot more understanding of the religion and uh, the practices and things like that I wouldn't have necessarily felt that pressure because people would have been like oh she's just another teenage girl you know but because it was like oh she's a teenage Muslim girl it was kind of like oh gosh like I carry both things now it wasn't ever detrimental to like my teen years or like me growing up. And it was a choice that I consciously made. My younger sister chose to wear it when she was 13. And then my youngest chose to wear it, I think, when she was about 16 or something like that. So we all chose at different points in our lives whenever it felt right for us. But I think for me, it was, I would rather wear it now so that I can evolve and become, you know, the person that I'm meant to be rather than, you know, have all of this confidence growing up and not wearing it. And perhaps making different choices that don't reflect my faith and then suddenly deciding to put it on, I don't know, at 25 when I've got an established network and established job, all of these other things. But yeah, it was very much a conscious decision that I made when I was 13. When did you start traveling and did you take a gap year? I started traveling when I finished university. So my parents gifted myself and three friends a trip to Europe of our choosing. So I think I chose Berlin because I really wanted to see the Berlin Wall at the time. So that was my first trip without my parents. But we were very fortunate growing up in that we were able to have at least one holiday a year. Often we would go back to Libya, which is where my parents are from. And we did, you know, stints to Italy, Dubai, the UAE, et cetera, et cetera. So I had been traveling from a younger age, but obviously with the security of my parents. But I think after university, I was then given that trust that, okay, you can live by yourself. Therefore, you're probably able to catch a flight by yourself. It was a really, really eye opening experience. Like it was fun to plan things and create your own itinerary. And it also kind of made me a bit more aware of the world and perhaps the dangers in it and perhaps the, um, the prejudgments in the world as well. But I think. Yeah, I'm very careful with what I absorb in like the media and I don't really like to prejudge a place before going. So I think like traveling is a really, really important part of life. And it's something that I'm very grateful to have experienced from a younger age. 
So when did you start wanting to go on more hikes or like sign up for the bigger challenges of, you know, Everest Base Camp, K2 Base Camp? When did those dreams start happening? It was actually the year that I wore the headscarf. So it kind of like hit me that there were many women like us in the mountains and a little charity trip came about to Snowden actually. So it was quite, it was a women only trip. And I think there were probably about 12 of us, 13 of us, and we were all similar ages. None of us had known each other on met. So I decided to go and I went along with my sister. And unfortunately we weren't able to summit because of bad weather and because of the pace of the group. So I was extremely frustrated because I had it in my mind that I was going to make it to the top of this mountain and it was going to be incredible and I wasn't able to do it. So I booked another trip and I went again. Um, and again, I wasn't able to summit the second time either because it was a really, really large group. So it was about 110 people maybe on this, on this second trip. So then I booked a third trip and that's when I was finally able to summit and it was during summer. So we had excellent weather. And I just remember like the struggle of getting up there as a 13 or 14 year old and just realizing how big the reward was, like just seeing the world and all its beauty and realizing that actually the journey to get to Snowden, which was, I think was about five or six hours at that point was totally worth it. And I just thought, this is like every single trip in my life or every single struggle in my life. Like it might be a struggle to get to that point, but once you're there, it's so rewarding. And it just kind of taught me never to give up on things. So it was really symbolic. I think even the having to go back like a third time to make it happen, it was a really symbolic moment. And I always said to myself after that trip, I think I was actually on the summit when I thought to myself, one day I'll go to Everest. And it just kind of stuck with me. And I wanted to, to make sure, you know, that other Muslim women um, had somebody to look up to because even at that age, I'd never seen a Muslim woman like go to Everest or go hiking. And even I think trips away from home were kind of still very frowned upon in certain cultures, luckily not my own, but I know some of my friends weren't even, even able to come to Snowden because their parents were completely against them having a night away from home, even though it was, you know, like a women's only group or a girl's only group. So yeah, I just remember wanting to do that for myself uh, more than anything, but also for my younger self to have somebody or some, yeah, somebody to look up to and something to aspire to and realising that goals are actually limitless. So you had the dream when you were about sort of 13. When did you start taking, making plans to actually turn that dream into a reality? Like how did the trip come about? I do this thing where I do like a vision board every year. So it was on my vision board for a good maybe three years and it was never something I was able to take off. And one year I went to like, I think it was the Halal Food Festival actually. And I just went for some good food. Like that was it. I went with a friend and I was actually approached by Harun, who was working for a charity at the time. And he he came over to me and he said, like, do you want some orange juice? And I was like, yes, please. Thank you so much. Had a cup of orange juice. And it was him trying to like recruit people for this charity trip going to Everest. And as soon as he mentioned Everest, I was like, oh my goodness, like that's been a goal of mine forever. And so I ended up going with Harun, actually, who's the founder of Muslim Hikers. And we've been friends ever since then. And I think that was about nine years ago, maybe now. So it kind of came about, but I think it's so important to have that vision and never to stop having it. And even if you have something as your, the wallpaper on your phone, like it could materialize. It might not be complete by the end of the year, but it's always been something that I've aspired to do. And at the same time, you know, as well as achieving my own goal of like going to Everest, I was also able to fundraise. I think it was about 9,000 pounds for charity as well at the time. So it was not only helping myself, it was helping others. And we got to see, you know, how that aid was spread and what it was going towards. I find it really rewarding to not only be able to check off my own goals and aspirations in life, but also to help others. I think it's really, um, it's really important. So what did your training and your preparation look like for Forever Space Camp? Did you already have like the hiking gear and the equipment that you needed to, to go over there? Or were you needing, you know, to buy new stuff, figure out, yeah, like the gear, what was going to work for you, start a training plan? Or did you already have sort of like quite a good level of good base of fitness? It was actually, I think I did Ben Nevis just before I went to um, Everest. But up until that point, it was a lot of research. So I'd watch YouTube videos. I would read up on a lot of blogs to find out what the best boots were and things like that. So I ended up being really, really prepared. And I'd prepared, I think maybe five or six months in advance, like as in I'd had my bag, my duffel bag, and I started already packing and, you know, making sure that everything was in line. And yeah, I think preparation is key for these things, like reading up on other people's experiences, knowing what to buy, knowing what to take with you, but also ensuring that your weight is 
uh, within its limits is like so important. And I think a lot of people don't realize that you actually have a porter designated to you to carry your bags. And when you have that responsibility of ensuring somebody else's safety as well on the mountain and making sure they're not carrying too much of your belongings, there's other elements that like are added to the complexity of packing. But yeah, so I was already running, I think, I was going to the gym at that point and I was running probably about five miles, like maybe three or four times a week. So I already knew that I had the ability physically to do it. And I think I did maybe an altitude chamber once to just see how I was going to be with the altitude. But because I was under 25, obviously 20, I think 25 years old and below are really affected by um, high altitude changes. I think above 25, you're less likely to suffer with it. But because I was under the age of 25, I did actually suffer with the altitude. Before, like I, I knew I would even in the altitude chamber. So yeah, I did everything that I could possibly do to prepare for it, I think in advance. And I just made sure I asked as many people's opinions, like online, any blogs or anything that I found just to ensure that I had prepared myself adequately. Um, and fitness levels, I think were already quite good anyway, but I knew it was going to be like mind over matter when I went. So yeah, I think training your mind to be resilient is a completely different type of training. Yeah, John, let's talk about that. I love that mind over matter, training your mind. What are your tips and tricks? What have you found that has worked well for you? In my day to day life, I really like to start my day off with yoga. I used to have a very chaotic lifestyle where I would wake up and check my phone immediately and then I'd be bombarded by text messages and emails and things I had to do even before I'd properly open my eyes. So I wake up and then I do some yoga and get into like a really good state of mind where there isn't chaos looming at first, you know first opening of the eyes and then after that I just kind of tell myself I do some affirmations like in the mirror and I'm like everything's going to be okay like you can get through anything whichever problems that you face in the morning or whichever problems you face today are problems that you can get through if you don't resolve them today there's always tomorrow and that's kind of the mindset that I attack most things with so I do that and also I think prayer and faith is a really big part of that as well and there's a big acceptance of like God's plan is the best plan as much as like, you know, you can, you can be positive and you can tell yourself that you can get through things. You have to also have a level of acceptance that if something happens, it's because it's meant to be ha- meant to happen. And you're also meant to be at that exact point or place at that exact moment is part of a bigger plan. So, um, acceptance is a really big part, I think, of, of training yourself for like resilience and also just making sure that asking yourself, is it because my feet can't carry me that I can't continue? Or is it because I just feel like I can't? If you're physically unable, it's a completely different thing, I think, to if you're you're tired or you're fatigued. So I think I had to just keep reminding myself and asking myself while I was on that trip that, can my feet continue? If the answer is yes, then I should continue. Then it's just my mind that's like holding me back. And then just asking myself, what can I do to make it better for myself? So could I have a sip of water? Would that improve my um, state? Or could I have a snack? Or do I need some sugar right now? So it's just kind of checking in with your brain constantly and just making sure that your brain is aligned and that you're, you're physically well enough to continue. Tell us more about your experience over in Nepal. What were some of the challenges you faced? What were some of the highlights? You know, what was that trip like? You know, how many people were on it? How many days were you out there for? Um, Yeah, just, just share a little bit more about that journey. I think we were gone for like three weeks in total. Um, that like getting the visa and everything was like a very e- easy process. The Nepalese are lovely, lovely people. So on arrival, we were greeted, but I think one of the biggest challenges was that we were such a big group. I think there were about 50 of us almost on that single trip. So it meant that we had to have book out like entire tea houses and things like that. But actually I thought it was quite lovely because, you know, we had the security of our group. And then, yeah, on arrival to Nepal, like it was a bit of a culture shock. It it was like nothing else we've ever experienced, I think, any of us. And it was just really exciting. It was a really exciting time. And we started our hike. We had to firstly, I think, fly to like the most dangerous airport in the world, which is Lukla. And then we started our hike. And I just remember the, the biggest shock to the system was actually the state of the toilets in Lukla Airport. So if you ever go, avoid those toilets. That's what I would advise. But one of our guides, he thought it'd be hilarious to tell me that we had a four hour hike after arriving to the airport. So I was kind of forced into using that toilet and it kind of, he was like, well, you've got the worst lavatory out the way. And he was like, that was my plan. And he was like, if you could do that, you could do anything. I was like, oh, like I was quite annoyed that I had to experience that. But I was like, oh, you know what? If this is the worst, it's going to be, it'll be fine from then on. Had the worst toilet experience, arrived at the world's most dangerous airport and then started our hike. And we arrived to our tea house, I think within like 
maybe two hours, maybe less than that. And it was just absolutely beautiful. Like we passed all of these beautiful aqua waters. Like while we were walking across, we crossed over a small bridge and we were just taking in the sights. And I remember it took us so long because we were all in awe and we were all had our phones out. We were all taking photos. And I remember after that first day, they had to make a rule of like, please don't stop when you're taking a photo because we all took so long, but we were just admiring what was around us. And it was just even just thinking back to it now, it just takes me to a place of like peace and serenity. That's how I describe it. And um, we arrived to our tea houses. They're very kind of shack-like. The walls are very thin in these tea houses, but everything is made with love. Like the food is made with love. We all got settled in. You have to use your flashlight for a lot of things. The electricity isn't particularly strong in that part of the world. And um, yeah, like my guide said we got the worst toilet out of the way so our toilets and our accommodation were actually okay like lovely and we all enjoyed supper together that evening and although it was cold I think it was probably about maybe minus one at that point although it was quite cold for us and what we were used to we all just like huddled around the fire like in the living room and it was just a really beautiful beautiful moment and we were all just kind of building up to that excitement of the next day of like the first full day's hike and we faced like a lot of challenges along the way there were because we were such a big group it was obviously very mixed abilities so a few people had injuries like on the first day on the second day but I think it was day eight or nine maybe that we lost quite a few people as in uh, they decided to drop out and it wasn't for them and that was when we were I can't remember I think it might have been Deng Boucher which is an extremely cold and deserted place. Um, and what's nice about Everest is that along the way you'll pass villages, schools, like people actually live on this mountain. You'll see 80 year old women carrying these huge six foot panels on their backs. Um, you'll see people carrying washing machines on their backs. Like it's just, it's a completely different world, but people live and function on that mountain. And I think that's probably the most beautiful thing about it, that you pass people just living their lives and you're able to interact with those people too. Like it's just a really fun, enjoyable experience. But I think when we got to Deng Boucher, it was just a completely deserted place and it was cold. And I think that was the first time we were just on a glacier and just like surrounded by ice and snow. Before then, yes, it was cold, but we would have hints of sunshine and it was fairly warm when you were walking, but that place was just deserted. Um, and the rest of us kind of like pressed on and we just had a, we just kind of knew that things were starting to get kind of very, very difficult and it was all starting to get very real. So like the light senses of humor, like the excitement in the evenings to stay up and play card games or to just chat was kind of fading at this point. It was just still beautiful. And we were told, you know, like snow leopards are in this part of the world. Like people come here just to spot them. There aren't very many. It's obviously like a protected like wildlife park as well. But I think I have to say by far my favourite spot during that trip on Everest Base Camp was Namchi Bazaar. And it's just this valley, um, which you've probably seen loads and loads of photos of. And the stars are just outstanding. You can see them with such clarity in the nighttime. And yet you're in this valley, which is beautifully lit up. And there are shops, there are cafes, there are homes, there are, yeah, there are hotels. It's just a really surreal place to be, but absolutely stunning, absolutely stunning. And you're surrounded by history, like the first person to summit Everest was there and it happened on the Queen's coronation and it happened the year that my dad was born. So all of these like exciting elements were like tying everything together while I was on this big trip of a lifetime with my best friend. And also this group of people who I'm still very much in touch with and still play a a role in my life and still climb mountains too. So um overall like the experience was just incredible and I think the last push like on the on the last day we kind of woke up to everything frozen our water bladders were frozen up and it was extremely cold and I think it had reached like minus 28 at that point so we were all although we had our sleeping bags we were sleeping in our coats like I said everything was freezing outside that anything that was outside of the sleeping bag was frozen like your water bottle would be frozen your baby wipes would be frozen everything would just be rock solid so we woke up and it was already a challenge to like force ourselves out of our really cozy warm sleeping bags and just to get downstairs and get ready to go and we started that journey and just getting to to base camp I think I was the first female to get to base camp in that group just getting there was just an extremely tearful and emotional like journey, like just realizing that all of our struggles up until that point, the excruciating cold, um, seeing like your teammates not being able to cope, like obviously being around everybody else's emotions. People had been airlifted at that point out of, out of Everest Base Camp, like members of our group, uh, as they weren't able to continue, like people, people had really suffered. And just to make it there and see the remainder of our group there was just such a big, exciting and overjoying feeling. 
And it was also very, very liberating. And I just kind of reiterated the fact that if you put your mind to something, you can make it happen despite the struggles and despite the challenges. Did you get the adventure blues when you came back home? Yes. And also it was funny because we were all so jet lagged. So when we arrived back home, because we'd spent like three weeks, just over three weeks, all waking up at the same time, having breakfast together and all of this kind of thing. When we arrived back home, our WhatsApp group would always be active. And it was the equivalent of, I think, 3am in the UK. So we would all be messaging like, oh, is anybody missing the porridge in the morning? Like who's up? And all of us would still be awake and like very much missing the adventure. And quite a lot of us actually ended up planning a few more adventures that we ended up doing together after that. But it was very much like, as soon as we got back, what's the next big thing? Like you can't, I think when you go, when you come back from an adventure that big, you have to have something to look forward to. And I think that's kind of how I live my life now that as soon as I'm back from something, I have to have something to look forward to because it's very easy to fall into a rut of that was so amazing. Like, what am I going to do next? Like life is that actual real life is very boring, like very mundane. So I really live my life now thinking what's going to be the next adventure. Yeah. What was the next adventure? I ended up going to Kilimanjaro actually, and I didn't book it too long after that. I think I waited maybe two weeks and then I booked onto Kilimanjaro and quite a few people from the Everest base camp crew also joined us uh, for that as well. And that, that was pretty epic. Tell us more about climbing Kilimanjaro. What was that experience like? Kilimanjaro was extremely different. I think I had different expectations only because I'd seen, I think that year there were some celebrities that had done it for uh, Red Nose Day or something, maybe. Um, so they took on Kilimanjaro and I was actually very inspired by that. But I hadn't really watched too much about Kilimanjaro. I think with Everest, I did a lot of research, but for Kilimanjaro, I knew that I could take a lot of my old kit, that I wouldn't really need to adjust too much. And so I went, although I was prepared, I didn't realise there was going to be torrential rain. <laughs> So that was an oversight on my part. So I saw people that had said in the group chat before we'd travelled, the group chats also before big adventures are really important. Um, A few people had said like, well, we're taking ponchos with us, like festival type ponchos. And I thought like, this is hilarious. Like people don't really know what they're talking about. Why is everyone taking a poncho? And so I didn't think to take one with me. And I went and I was extremely soaked through with all of my kit, despite the Gore-Tex, despite the waterproofing, despite the products for extra waterproofing I was soaked through every single day after 12 hours of walking you don't realize that your waterproofs will no longer be waterproof so people had their waterproofs on but they also had a layer of like poncho on top to prevent this Um, but we went during December which is apparently when they have their torrential rains but it was beautiful like the first I would say like the first day of hiking was an incredible experience just because you get to experience Africa firstly like you there's a really beautiful drive to Kilimanjaro and the whole time you can see Kilimanjaro ahead of you so unlike Everest where you don't see Everest until the very end you can see Kilimanjaro from day dot so you know what you're going up you can see it as a goal ahead of you as well and it's just beautiful like the areas around the greenery the nature you can see all these like ladies that are farming around you and it just gets you into the spirit And also you're hiking with people who are very proud of their culture. So we were constantly surrounded by like uh, tribal songs, like traditional songs. And it was just so exciting. It created such an exciting vibe. But also on day one, you walk through the rainforest and you get to experience wildlife like never before. It also, it feels like a really intimate, like one-on-one experience with these animals. So you get to see monkeys. There are really beautiful birds, like colourful birds, like just insects, like just absolutely beautiful wildlife. And you're walking through it in absolute awe so it takes away from like the labor of the walking I guess but it's also an extremely slow pace because with Kilimanjaro it's a constant uphill whereas with Everest it's constantly up and down up and down up and down so the altitude doesn't hit you necessarily all in one go and there's some form of acclimatizing on Everest but with Kilimanjaro it's a constant up 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 so you have to take things a lot slower which is which I'm very very grateful for because I don't really suffer with any altitude sickness with Kilimanjaro though as you're walking you're getting rained on for 12 hours of the day or 10 hours of the day however long you're walking for and you're soaked through and because there's you're staying in tents on Kilimanjaro you're not staying in tea houses there's no form of heating or electricity or anything like that so you very much have to rely on yourself for a lot of these things and make sure that you're kitted out well. So it's a very, very mentally challenging place to be in. But uh, I think the most enjoyable day for me on Kilimanjaro was when we got to Baranka Wall. And it's this vertical wall that you have to like use your hands and feet to like traverse across. 
and you're on a ledge pretty much the whole time, like a vertical ledge. And it's absolutely stunning. It's beautiful. You can see people walking across it, like attempting it, but it also requires like a level of skill and a level of like love of adventure and adrenaline too, because you are literally hanging off a vertical wall. But it was so exciting. And I remember that day, that was our first sign of sun. And we got to the top of that wall and the sun was just beaming down on us. And we were like, oh, this is beautiful. Like we just rolled up our sleeves. We were just sunbathing, waiting for the rest of the team to come up. And it was just such a beautiful moment. But unlike Everest with Kilimanjaro people don't live on that mountain it's a dormant volcano there isn't really much that grows on there by way of of plantation it's very harsh conditions and yeah people don't live up there so there isn't really that sense of community you are walking through very rural parts of the world Um, it has its own beauty but yeah you could be faced with some days where it's just fog and I think it's challenging when there's nothing to reward you while you're walking so normally you would have stunning views or rivers or you know wildlife but on that mountain on that dormant volcano there isn't really very much if it's foggy you're walking into fog and you just have to have either some very good music in your ears something motivational in your ears or very good conversation with somebody else as you're walking but it's very taxing doing that walk for a long time as well but I think we could all agree anyone who's ever done Kilimanjaro that the most challenging part of Kilimanjaro is summit day up until that point it's a breeze and even that breeze is a very difficult harsh breeze but up until that point it's fairly easy going um but on summit night you'll be woken up at like three or four a.m to start your ascent obviously it'll be dark so you have your head torches and it's a very 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 long long day to get up to summit and also there are two summits there's stellar point so just to get to stellar point is very very exhausting uh we had to use crampons to get up there because it was extremely poor conditions a lot of snow a lot of ice so we got up to still a point and i think it would have been very easy for a lot of us to just be like this is my summit this is where i'm gonna end my hike like it's been amazing and anyone like in their right mind who had done that hike would be like yeah this is enough for me but when you have a bit of crazy and you have (laughs) high aspirations and high goals you know that's not the true summit and you'll want to continue. So pushed on and uh, reached that summit. But there was a snowstorm that was also brewing. It was just treacherous conditions. So literally, we just got up there, had a quick photo. and There was no time. We literally had to start running back down to avoid the snowstorm. And so that's exactly what we did. So literally got up there, had, a, had I think, maybe two or three photos, one group photo, and just quickly started running down. And um the porters were incredible. Like had it have not been for the porters, I don't think any of us would have made it. When you go from like, I think it was like 4,000 something meters up to 5,000 something uh, in a day, the altitude really, really hits you. So it's incredibly difficult. And so on the way back down, all I wanted to do from the exhaustion was just sleep. And Mm. it's beautiful because on the way back down, you're passing through all of this volcanic ash. So like black ash, like it's beautiful. It's like a desert of ash all downhill. I think if anyone had skis or a snowboard, like that's the first thing that you'd want to do. You'd want to just jump on skis or a snowboard and just like go all the way down with that because it would have been epic. But because we were so tired, all I wanted to do was lay down and sleep. And I think my teammates were exactly the same. And our porters at one point just grabbed us by the feet and were like, come on, like we need to get you down. It's dangerous to fall asleep here. We're just pulling us down, down the hill. And like, eventually once we reached the point where we could walk again and we weren't as exhausted, like we were like, that was so much fun. So we had a really, really good time and got back to camp fairly late. And ironically at the top of Kilimanjaro was where we had the most phone signal. So I was able to FaceTime my family when I got back to the camp up there. And I told them that I just reached the top and I was really excited. I got to show them around on FaceTime. And then I just went straight into my tent and crashed out. (laughs) But it was an incredible feat. And I really enjoyed like going back down because going back down off Kilimanjaro, it's all downhill. So (laughs) it was just an easy ride, like back down to the bottom. And it was really good fun. And we were skipping down and singing down. And, you know, we had all the, we'd learned all these tribal songs and we were all having a really good time with the porters. And it was, it was just wonderful. It was just an incredible experience. How did it work with regards to prayers? So were there accommodations made so that you could continue to pray while you were climbing the mountain? Actually, it doesn't really require very much, to be honest with you. Like we're able to, uh, there's a little like pre prayer wash that we have to do which is called wudu so we do that ourselves like we just need access to like some form of running water and then we just need a prayer mat so normally I would carry one with me a lot of the porters were also Muslims so they also were doing their own prayers too but you just literally need a small space where you're not going to be necessarily disturbed put down your mat and then you can just pray like there's no special like facilities or requirements that are really needed to be 
or adjustments that needed to be made, we would stop anyway for like lunches and things like that. Like that. So that would be a great opportunity to pray. But also in Islam, there's traveler's prayer. So if you are traveling for a certain amount of time or a distance, which is applicable to Kilimanjaro and Everest and all of these places that I've been to, then your prayers are actually shorter. So our religion is very accommodating to these kind of trips and experiences. So it wasn't anything that a couple of minutes, you know, away from the group or with the group would have allowed for. And then your most recent adventure was like a double adventure in 2022, Broad Peak and K2 base camps. How were those experiences? Epic, epic. Once in a lifetime, that's for sure. I won't be rushing back there, but absolutely epic. Um, It was unlike anything I'd ever done before, because despite the challenges, this was also a much longer challenge and it was also a lot more rural so where Everest and Kilimanjaro have been explored by many people from all over the world K2 still remains a very like secret spot uh, I would say and just from where you land at the airport to Skardu in Pakistan you have to fly into Pakistan to Islamabad or any any other airport then you also have to catch another internal flight to Skardu which is the mountain regions and then from there I think it was about an eight hour jeep ride And when I say eight hour Jeep ride, I don't mean just like, oh, like driving in a Jeep down like some country roads, some tarmac roads. (laughs) It's it's off roading to the extreme. So we're talking big boulders and this car goes over these these huge boulders that you probably would need several steps to get over yourself if you're doing it on foot. Absolutely wild, like crazy, crazy ride, which I've actually put onto my Instagram highlights just because it was absolutely manic that we were doing it. Like, and there were no seatbelts in these Jeeps. Like it was just a crazy ride just to even get to the start point of the hike. So we arrived and to be honest with you, like if they were to plonk a hotel at the start of like the K2 base camp hike, it would be like a five-star resort. And because the it's just really bizarre. Like you don't expect to go to that part of the world and then be faced with these pristine white sandy like beaches almost. Just really, really surreal landscapes and scenery that none of us had ever expected. So our first night of camp was basically on one of these spots, which was like pristine, white, clear, beautiful sand with like boulders around and you could hear the river flowing beside you as well. Just absolutely like out of the ordinary, nothing like we would have ever expected. So we all had supper together. We all pitched our tents or our porters pitched our tents actually for us. And we spent the first night in absolute like peace and quiet with just the sound of the river like flowing. It was just idealistic. From then on, it didn't really disappoint. Like that was kind of the scenery for the majority of the nights. But it was a lot more difficult because we had a lot more to cover on foot because there's no access to roads or anything. So we were doing probably, I I would say about 10 hour days to start off with, with only one break in the middle. And that was for like super noodles, like for lunch and prayer time. Uh, And then we would continue with our walk. So it was extremely taxing in terms of like the time time frames and also in terms of like the manpower that was required there were also river crossings that we had to get across that involved some wading across rivers like in your boots or taking off your boots and crossing them and we also we had mules carrying our bags and also porters so we had a really really big team I think for 10 of us we had over 40 porters like just to do the very basics like fill up our water put up our tents carry our bags so it was a huge 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 like team effort and yeah like I say there weren't very many of us so it was actually really nice to have a really small group because that was, I think, the smallest group that I've had on an international hike. So we all formed very close-knit bonds that, that will last a lifetime, no doubt. I think things got really difficult when we reached the glacier. So up until that point, we were walking through these beautiful, like, sandy terrains. And there was a part that actually reminded me of, like, a rubbish, like, tip site not in aesthetic but just in terms of like the mounds of different colored rocks like from afar you wouldn't really be able to see what it was but actually like traversing it was absolutely insane and you would go up and down these huge huge mounds and sometimes around them and then you would just be met with this like bright green huge puddle of water like a little lake in between them and it was just surreal like you would pick up purple rocks like red rocks and it was just beautiful And then we reached the glacier and that's when, yeah, like I say, things got really difficult. There was a military base camp, which was pitched there. I dread to think what the poor guys who are stationed there have to like live through, but it was just extremely isolating. And there was literally nobody around. You couldn't see anybody for miles. You'd maybe walk for like four or five 
hours and not see a single soul. We reached that point and that's when we saw like the military for the first time who were extremely lovely and very welcoming. But at this point we had to combine two days of walking into one. So we had a really long day. I think it was, I think it was about 12 hours of walking with only a small break in the middle for like soup or something. And we had to continue walking because it was extremely poor conditions and we weren't even sure if we were going to make it to base camps. There are reports of people who were at base camp at that point who were a couple of days ahead of us who had experienced avalanche, like tearing through their camps, tearing through their mess tents and yeah just like literally boulders sliding down hills that there was a lot of like landslides situations happening or rock slides I don't really know what the correct term is to describe that but extremely like adverse conditions so we trekked on and I just remember we got to the camp that day and we were like what on earth have we all done like we just spent 12 hours trekking all you can see is white everywhere you look everything is covered in snow you can't see another human being like if you were to get lost no one would find you. Like it was just wild. And the path obviously had disappeared and we were relying on our porters who were very knowledgeable in the field and kind of knew the way luckily. But if you were to be separated from your porter, like that would be the end of you. There was no sign of a path ahead of you. So yeah, we arrived there and then we arrived to Concordia the next day, which was like the main camp. And again, it was like a godforsaken place, but it was just absolutely stunning because when you look up, that was the first real sign of like just how vast the landscape is around you. So you'd look up and you'd see K2, you'd see Broad Peak, you'd see all these other huge mountains that people have never been able to summit. Again, we were in plummeting temperatures. I think we were in minus 20 at that point. So extreme cold. Didn't really want to leave my tent. Couldn't really socialise with other people. I was just paralysed because of the cold, but just knew we had to push on. And then we reached Broad Peak Base Camp the day after that. And that day was the day that we reached Broad Peak. And we also had to go and summit not summit, sorry, we had to go reach K2 base camp and then also return back to Broad Peak base camp, which is where we were camping. But by the time we'd reached Broad Peak, all of us were at the point of just extreme exhaustion. We would all laid down during our lunch break and just had a nap. Like we were just that tired. Um, and also failing to prepare as preparing to fail. I have had bought these lovely sunglasses with me, which were like extremely chic, beautiful looking. I had so many compliments on them, but they weren't for the snow at all. So I did actually end up with sunburnt eyeballs that day. <laughs> we pressed on as a team. And I remember I was at the front of the group setting the pace and uh, our team leader, Bilal, who I also still work very closely with at the moment, he said to me, look, we're going to have to really press on. We've literally, we've got an hour to make it there. If we don't make it there, we have to turn the group around and come back. And I was like, oh no. I was like, I like at this moment in time, I'm giving it everything that I have. I can't possibly go any faster. I'm not going to make it. And that was the first time I ever had that doubt in my head that I'm not going to make it. So I said to everybody, I was like, you guys go ahead. And the team were like, no, no, no. Like you're at the front, you're setting the pace. No one's going to go ahead of you. And I was like, guys, I don't think I'm going to make it. Like, please just go ahead. So we just had this moment of like deciding what was going to happen ne next and me just forcing everyone to go ahead of me. And I just said, you know what? I'm going to stick to the back of the group. If I make it, I make it. If I don't make it, I know I gave it my all. And Bilal said to me, who was our team leader, I'm not going to let you stay at the back. He was like, I'm the team leader. I'm leading from the back. You're in front of me. So he took the lead from the back and he said, Zara, I'm not letting you go home. You've been at the front this entire time. You're not going home without getting to this base camp. So he really like pressed on and like so at some points was pushing me with my bag, like ahead of him, like to just make sure that I was keeping the pace and staying ahead. And yeah, honestly, without people like that, it's so easy sometimes for your mind, despite how strong you think you are, for your mind to just come up trumps and say, no, you're not, you're not going to make it. Like you haven't got anything left in the tank to make it. But actually my feet would have carried me. And I know that now, <laughs> obviously looking back. And I just, at that point, I think like I was just defeated. Like my eyes were aching, like everything was aching. My eyes were burnt. Uh, my head, like I had a headache. I was extremely cold. Everything was against me, but I didn't ask myself those crucial questions of, can my legs carry me? The answer was definitely yes. What can I do to make it better for myself? I know for a fact that if I'd had a snack or had something to eat at that point in time, I would have given myself the energy that I needed to be able to continue. But I think it was also the panic of if we don't make it in the next hour, I had a huge sense of responsibility in my back that I'm setting the pace. And if I don't move any faster, then I'm holding everybody else behind too. But yeah, like without Bilal, I wouldn't have been able to do it. I think I would have 
easily have allowed my mind to have like just taken over at that point. But this is where like teammates and like people who really know you really play a really big role in your life and surrounding yourself with good people is so important. So we made it to Broad Peak. All of us burst into tears. Like we were all hugging and congratulating one another. And it was just, oh, it was just such a beautiful moment. And we were passing team members of NIMS because he was doing his uh, K2 exhibition expedition then too. So he was flying into K2 base camp a couple of days after we'd arrived, but we'd already seen like his camp set up and his teammates, things like that. So passing people who already had their sights on like huge goals and knowing we were like sharing the same space as them was just an incredible feeling. Yeah, it was just surreal. And then on the walk back, it's funny when you think you've run out of energy just to make it there, you find the energy to get yourself back to like safety and back to like home turf and back to your camp when you know what's ahead of you. But I just remember I got back to my camp. I got to my tent and I just, I was, I'm going to be sick. <laughs> I'm going to be sick. And I, I, was, I was sick. It was just all of the energy that I knew that I just had exhausted myself with. I was just sick from exhaustion. So I was sick, had loads of water, had something to eat and just went straight to bed. But I like to this day, it's still one of the biggest achievements of my life. But would I go back? Probably not. (laughs) So you're a member and a team leader of Muslim Hikers, which is all about sort of inspiring Muslims to get outdoors, UK based. Would you like to share more about your role and what you do in that space and what people can expect from, from Muslim Hikers? I mentioned Harun earlier. So he and I had done um, Everest Base Camp together. I also did Kilimanjaro with him too. So we've known each other for probably eight or nine years now. And he ended up founding Muslim Hikers just because there was always a really big intake from the Muslim community whenever a charity hike was arranged. And he just knew that there was a space for Muslims out there. And unfortunately, a lot of Muslims aren't raised in these rural areas. Um, If you have parents who are immigrants or have migrated to the country, then a lot of these families would have settled in cities where there were jobs. So the natural instinct to go into a mountain isn't necessarily there or the comfort isn't necessarily to go there. And I know that I was probably one of these people too, whereas like walking for fun wasn't really a thing that my parents did either, despite them seeing the beauty in it, they never felt confident or comfortable or didn't really know how to approach it. So although like we don't need an invitation to go out into the into the mountains, it's really important to feel safe and have an introduction to that. And I think Muslim Hikers is an excellent place or intro to that um, for anybody who doesn't already have the confidence to go out into the mountains or to start hiking. Um, We've had people that are like 70 years old and they've never been on a hike ever and they've joined Muslim Hikers and they've come along to a hike and, you know, joined us and have gained that confidence and then have branched off and taken their friends to the same route that we've explored together. So It's just a really, really important and pivotal starting point, I think, for a lot of Muslims in the UK. And it's not excluding any other groups. Like It's open to everybody, but it's just a safe space where anybody who would like to join us is more than welcome. So we do have regular non-Muslims who attend hikes with us and they love like and enjoy the atmosphere. For us, it's all about the vibes and creating the exciting feeling around being outdoors and encouraging others to explore it and encouraging the next generations. Also, like hiking has been a huge part of British culture but it hasn't been a big part of like Muslim or immigrant culture. So we're trying really hard to introduce that and make sure that everybody feels welcome and comfortable and knows how to go about hiking in the UK too. And Zara Rose, where's the best place for people to connect with you, to connect with Muslim hikers? Where should they find you online? So Muslim Hikers, if you just type that into um, Instagram, that'll pop up. It's the page with the orange logo and you can find me on Zara Rose A on all platforms. But yeah. And Zara Rose, I'd love for you to have the the final words, final words of advice, final words of wisdom for women, especially sort of Muslim women out there who want to get active, who want to take on new challenges, you know, want to spend more time in the outdoors. Apart from just do it, what advice would you like to share? And you can take that in any direction that you would like. So my advice would be that if you don't see people like you or people um, that your children would aspire to be out there doing the things that you want to do or the things that you want to try, then take that step and do some research, approach groups, find a group that's suited to you and make yourself a part of that landscape. Um, The outdoors is for everyone. And I think sometimes we forget that although it's accessible, it's not easy for everybody to get to get out there. Sometimes we do need to find a community. So my, my, my biggest bit of advice would be to like find your people find your community but also be the representation that you want to see we're seeing a lot of brands that are now stepping up to the mark and being a lot more diverse a lot more inclusive so just be the change that you want to see um, and just make sure that the next generation are knowledgeable and and clued up on the outdoors and not only like not only applying that to the outdoors but also 
your goals are never too big. Anything you set your mind to, you're capable of, and just make sure you're always checking in with your brain (laughs) and just asking yourself like, am I able to do this? Am I able to continue? What can I do to make things easier for myself? I think that's really, really important. Um, But yeah, just know that nothing is beyond your limits. Do you have any other future goals and plans that you'd like to share? I'm always looking for my next adventure. Um, but I would, I would like to t- check off for this year to reach my 40 country goal. At the moment, I'm at 36. I unfortunately had a leg injury, so I had to cancel quite a few flights. But I would love to be at at least 40 countries come the end of the year for sure. Fingers crossed that you will get there. Bizarre Rose, thank you so much for coming on Tough Girl Podcast to share more about your passion for adventures, getting outside and, and climbing, climbing Kilimanjaro and doing all of these incredible base camps. It's been incredible to speak to you and just keep getting out there, keep inspiring and just best of luck with, uh, with reaching your 40 countries before the end of the year. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me today on the Tough Girl podcast. I hope you've all been inspired by the amazing stories and insights from our guest, Zara Rose. Remember, being tough doesn't mean you have to be perfect or fearless. It means being resilient, determined and willing to take on challenges that push you out of your comfort zone. I'd like to leave you with a few words of encouragement. If you're facing a tough challenge right now, know that you have the strength and resources within you to overcome it. You don't have to do it alone. Reach out to your support network, ask for help when you need it and stay focused on your goals. And if you're feeling stuck or unsure of what your next step should be, remember that it's okay to take a break, to rest and recharge and to reflect on your priorities. Sometimes the most important thing you can do is listen to your intuition and take small steps forward, even if they're not perfect or linear. Thank you so much for being part of the Tough Girl community. If you'd like to support the work that I do, then please visit Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Tough Girl Podcast. And you can sign up as a patron to support the mission to increase the amount of female role models in the media. New episodes go live every Tuesday at 7 a.m. UK time. All that's left for me to say is wherever you are, whatever you are doing, give it your all. Give it 110%. Get after it. Go for it. Believe in yourself because I believe in you. Take care, lots of love, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.